harnessing the power of your mind is relatively simpler because that desire, what I call magnetic desire in the book, will motivate you to go through periods of feeling like nothing's happening without giving up. So that desire to want to change, to, to look for an answer or to ask more questions, like you said, um, that desire really helps because it, it forms awareness, which is key to the you know stages of behavior change. You don't know how much you want to change. You, you, that level of awareness hasn't happened yet. And even once you do have those experiences, we're just kind of getting to new baselines, right? We're peeling back layers and you're going to have another realization later on. Dividing your experience as a human into four quadrants and they are and then spiritual that word means something to a lot of people but it equally doesn't mean something to some people i feel like you're someone who is kind of straddling two worlds you're an md phd neuroscientist medical doctor who is also here talking about spirituality but what they found to their surprise was that almost as soon as you started mindfulness training it reduced anxiety, it reduced insomnia. So the way I want to answer that question is that I was taken aback by how obvious the answers to that question were and that literally all of the things that we need to be the most whole as a human have been in front of our eyes forever. Dr. Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited. I nerd out so hard on everything that you do, basically, but especially when we look at blending of the worlds of, of science and spirituality, what mm -hmm. we can explain and examine and study versus maybe what we can't or we mm -hmm. think we can't. And we're going to go into a lot of different areas uh, with your work and what you're focusing on now. But to kind of start there with mm -hmm. science and spirituality, your book now, which has been out, for a couple of years that is still just so top of mind for a lot of people. You have this very powerful question out of the gate or statement. And I, I want to just start there, please. Quote, we have the power to change our destiny to find wealth, true love, confidence, and fulfillment simply by harnessing the power of our mind. You make it sound so simple. What part of, quote, harness the power of our mind is simple? That's such a good question. And I, I want to give it a bit of context because my book did come out before the pandemic. And I would say that at that time, combining science and spirituality was a bit unusual. And I think given that I was known more for being faculty at MIT Sloan, people questioned it quite a lot. Um, but also I got, you know, amazing feedback and it definitely like even strengthened my belief in that combination. I think what happened then is that during the pandemic, a lot of people suffered mentally, if you like, and I'm using that as a really big umbrella word to say that, you know, you yourself may have had anxiety or, you know, chronic stress, depression, health anxiety, relationships broke down, people felt very lost and disconnected. So I've seen a massive resurgence in interest in the book. And I think that's because we're all searching for something more now. And that that combination of science and spirituality makes more sense now, maybe, than it did you know, when the book came it out. It certainly has for me. And I think you're spot on. A lot of people are really at least questioning those realms. Yeah. And in search for more questions and search for answers as well. Absolutely. And so I was, I was thinking about what I would say to you in answer to that question. And if you hadn't put it so nicely, what I would have said was... <laughs> you have to really want to change. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you really, really want to, then harnessing the power of your mind is relatively simpler because that desire, what I call magnetic desire in the book, will motivate you to go through periods of feeling like nothing's happening without giving up. So mm -hmm. that desire to want to change, to, to look for an answer or to ask more questions, like you said, um, that desire really helps because it, it forms awareness which is key to the you know stages of behavior change but I would also say that I mean it's kind of been 20 plus years now in the science world that we've understood more about neuroplasticity which is how much your brain can change throughout life throughout adulthood so that does make it simpler in terms of when we still believed that by the age of 18 
you physically stopped growing and your brain stopped changing and you were stuck with the that, personality. That's old science, that you, yeah. Yeah. Then, of course, it doesn't seem simple to think that you can harness the power of your mind to change your life. Like if it hasn't happened by then, good luck. Yeah. yeah. But now that we know that that's not true, that the brain actively grows and changes till we're about 25, and that with effort after the age of 25, we can bring about more changes, we can learn new things. With effort, everybody. With effort, with effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crucial. That's why I started by saying you have to really want to. Because to make the intensity of effort that you're going to have to make, you have to really want to. Otherwise, it's way too easy to give up. Um, and that's why often the sorts of changes that I think you and I are going to talk about today only happen after a crisis. Mm. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was that I wanted people to be able to understand how much agency they have to change their life with the power of their mind without having to wait till they go through some kind of crisis. I'm kind of laughing right now. This, uh, this friend of mine, uh, this guy who's been in um, this coaching program I've been running for a few years now, young guy, very ambitious and is very on board with this. And I think a lot of people can get on board with this. Mm -hmm. We believe that, okay, in a certain major life event, positive, negative, there's going to be a, a transformation. There's going to be a change, whether I ask for it or not. Mm -hmm. And I'm laughing because once he kind of really got on board with this belief system, he was like, man, when is something bad going to happen to me? <laughs> he was like, I'm ready for this change. I'm yeah, ready for yeah. this transformation. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, yeah. So shout out Dom, if you're listening, man. But um, you don't have to want something bad to happen to you. To, no. But to your point, awareness needs to happen. Awareness needs to happen so that when you are in your life, and there are a myriad of types of events happening, you can be looking for and creating and you know fanning that flame of change as well. Yeah, and in my experience as a former psychiatric doctor and as a coach, if something doesn't happen, like a divorce or a health crisis, mm -hmm. then eventually around a certain age, and in terms of the you know, psychological philosophy of Carl Jung, for mm -hmm. example, the age is sort of 40 to 42, that's a real transitional age. If you haven't had something, you know, happen in your life by then, then you'll just reach a sort of psychological existential crisis where you just start to question the meaning of life. You understand that you're kind of going into the second half of your life. Like if we haven't experienced death, a major loss, injury, divorce, divorce or significant life loss. Again. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, something seems to happen psychologically yeah. that, you know, so, so for Dom... Mm. Um, if nothing bad happens, then around the age of 40 to 42, he's probably going to go through some kind of emotional transformation regardless. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So then this makes me think about the person that is listening and maybe, maybe where, you know, I've been, you've been, that you don't know how much you want to change. Mm -hmm. You, you, that level of awareness hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And even once you do have those experiences, we're just kind of getting to new baselines, right? We're peeling back layers and you're going to have another realization later on. How would you kind of explain this to somebody that doesn't know they want to change yet? Mm. Um, two things. I remember myself before I made big changes, being at a stage of my life where I was like, I'm fine. You know, I've got a decent job. I've got the ability to travel. I'm, you know, happy in the relationship that I'm in. I'm still young. So I couldn't, you know, I was, like I said, fine. What I hadn't had any insight into was how much better life could be. Mm -hmm. And equally, I do sometimes hear from people now who say, you know, I'm up. I'm actually really happy with my life. I don't want it to change. But I, you know, I did push back with that person and say, that is rare. Mm. The number of people who feel so stuck, who are, you know, in a job that pays the bills, but they don't enjoy it at all. They're not fulfilled. Definitely not fulfilled. And, and possibly even have a good idea of what it was that they wished they could have done, but they're not doing it for, you know, maybe financial reasons or societal or, you know, parental or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I know how that goes. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, and, you know, possibly are in a relationship that's no longer very happy or, or was one that was a compromise in the first place. But the kind of fear of stepping out alone is, you know, preventing them from making a major change there. 
um, you know, maybe not happy in terms of things like health, fitness, shape, tone, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, self-esteem, self-confidence, all the things that go around in that area. So the question I ask people there, which I have actually posed in the book, which I thought you might be going towards, was has your life panned out exactly as you dreamt it would when you were a kid? And if not, then that's okay, but maybe start examining why not and maybe start asking yourself if it's still possible that you can have some, at least some of the things that you dreamt of, whether that's, you know, being married with a family or having your own business, you know, it could be such a wide variety of things, but... Whatever you want it to be. Yeah, and maybe it's just like one of those that you mm -hmm. pick now and say, I think I could still make that happen. How would you get someone to really wrap their head around, okay, there's a scientific approach. There's a way to understand and manipulate the body, the mind, you know, through sleep, hydration, good nutrition, movement. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other component, the things that, that I can't explain, the spiritual aspect. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to say for, for our conversation, we're going to say spirituality being all the things maybe that are not tangible and physical that, you know, that you can't, if I do A, then B kind of happens. Mm -hmm. How can we begin to wrap our heads around that other side of, of life? I, I think objectively we can agree that there is this unexplicable component mm -hmm. to life. So how do we wrap our head around something that we can't explain, that we don't know how we can manipulate, but we know is important <laughs> to influence our actual tangible physical life? So there's a really easy exercise towards the start of the book that is literally about dividing your experience as a human into four quadrants. Mm -hmm. And they are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And so physical is literally what you feel in your body. Mental is about your thought processes, so your logical thinking. Emotional is about your feelings, so the emotions that you experience, which can kind of go between physical and mental, you know, sometimes in a way. And then spiritual, that word means something to a lot of people, but it equally doesn't mean something to some people. So I always say what you feel in your spirit or in your values or something that's not explained by physical, mental or emotional, but you feel it. And what I ask people to do with those quadrants is to draw it out twice and time themselves for a minute, immersing themselves in the memory with the eyes closed of a time that you were really struggling, that things were not going right, that you were stressed, that there wasn't coherence in the group or team or family around you and really experience that in your body, in your thoughts, in your feelings, in your spirit, and then just make notes at the end of the minute. Mm. And then to, you know, maybe take a few deep breaths, put that memory behind you, and bring up a memory of a time that you were doing really well, feeling like you were, you know, being your best self in flow. There was a lot of coherence around you. Close your eyes, immerse yourself in that memory, and then after the one minute, make notes in the four quadrants. Yeah, wow. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's really about feeling it for yourself and then kind of just noting down what's similar and what's different. So I've literally heard every combination of what could be similar or different between, the, you know, from nothing in common at all to actually very much the same, but a different version of the same well, feeling. Of course, yeah, I bet. Um, for me, the thing that I learned by doing that exercise is that if I'm super stressed, then the thing I'm really aware of is what changes physically. So I would make less eye contact. I wouldn't smile. My posture might be more slumped. And those are things that I can reverse quite by choice. If I've got a negative thinking spiral or I'm just feeling really sad, it's really hard to reverse those by choice in the moment. But having the awareness about, you know, okay, that probably means that I'm in that mode is, is not bad. But I can always put my shoulders back, lift my chin up, smile, and make eye contact with someone. And that tends for me to have an effect on the other three things. I feel like you're someone who is kind of straddling two worlds. You're an MD, PhD, neuroscientist, medical doctor, who is also here talking about spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, you really remind me a lot of my wife. I was sharing with you earlier, she's an FNP, mm. uh, has been in mental health for many years, you know, running yeah. ketamine-assisted psychotherapy programs, yeah. clinics, and now she's in functional medicine. But when she found mental health, particularly in, in medicine, 
she felt like she was really coming home. And I'm wondering if the same was true for you too. Were you someone that went the medical route, clinical route, because like, oh, I'm this spiritual person. I already understand that side. And I just need to find a way to translate it to the rest of the world. Or through your scientific approach to life and understanding the human experience, did you just naturally kind of get more to the spiritual side? Definitely more the latter for me, but I'm really interested in what you posed as the former mm. option. Um, what, um, so what happened for me was that my parents had emigrated from India to England. So at home, I was surrounded by chanting and incense and, you know, oh, wow. food offerings yeah. to God and, um, you know, having to give gratitude before every that meal. That was your norm. That was, yeah. And, you know, being told that reincarnation, like it was a fact. Absolutely. You know, when your parents tell you that is how the world works as a kid, that's what you believe. Um, so I grew up like that. But then I also had to go to school in central London with people who were not from that cultural A little heritage. different. A yeah. little different. Um, and so I was straddling two worlds mm. for as long as I can remember, you know, since I was conscious. Mm. And I found that hard as a kid, um, just wanting to fit in with my friends. But what was also curious was that although my parents were, you know, very spiritual in that way, they wanted me to be a doctor. Um, so, you know, in Indian culture, being a doctor or a lawyer is like the kind of highest thing. Like I said, I, I know I'm familiar. My wife's Middle Eastern from Iran. Oh, so, yeah, oh okay. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They still are confused by like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mine were confused when I changed career yeah, for a yeah. long time. Um, so, again, I... I had a lot of pressure and expectation to become a doctor. And my parents were very proud of the fact that I was a doctor. But at home, they would not practice any Western medicine. Hmm. So it was all Ayurvedic. It was all alternative homeopathic. Really? Yeah. So I've really, like, grappled with a lot of, like, dissonance in my life. Um, and I'm very grateful looking back. You know, I never had antibiotics till I was 18. I was, you know, brought up vegetarian and hmm. Ayurvedic. And um, I definitely think... And, you know, I had a very privileged education. So all of that has completely served me. But it did leave me quite confused as a human. Naturally, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so then when I came across people like Bruce Lipton or Deepak mm -hmm. Chopra or Daniel Siegel, I remember my first reaction to hearing Bruce Lipton on a podcast was, but that's not allowed. <laughs> you can't be Dr. Wow. Bruce Lipton. And be saying these things. And be saying these mm -hmm. things. But there was almost like a little seed that I, I can remember where I was. I, I can't remember which airport, but it was an airport. And I was listening in my headphones. And I remember thinking, maybe it, maybe it is allowed, but, that, but like not being able to really grapple with that thought at all. But, but just understanding that somebody who was a more advanced version of me was talking about things that, I personally believed in, but felt like I had to keep hidden from my professional world. Um, so when I did start writing The Source, I was really fascinated when I started doing the research that things like the laws of attraction and manifestation were so easily explainable by cognitive science, you know, that- Which you do a great job of explaining, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I spent a summer researching it and I thought, okay, this definitely makes sense. This has got like, there's content here. Um, started writing it kind of definitely was like a cathartic evolutionary journey for me, but I still was nervous about how it would be received. Wow. Why so? Um, what, what specifically? Because it was, I'm going to use the word woo woo. I thought people who see me as their executive coach mm. or see me as their lecturer at MIT would not, like be able to like grappling with, it. am I going to lose credibility? Am I going yeah. to lose respect? You know, am I going to fill a room anymore? Yeah. Wow. And on one of the pod first podcasts I was on when my book came out, um, because the title, the subtitle is actually different in the UK. It's open your mind, change your life. But in the U S it's secrets of the universe, the science of the brain. We and need that one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we need that one. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. so. Somebody said to me, yeah. like, didn't you think this was a risk? Didn't you think mm -hmm. you could lose your job at MIT? And actually, at that point, I was like, no, I didn't think I would lose my job. Um, but, you know, it made me think, OK, I, it's not that's not in my mind. Like somebody else also thought that was strange. 
But I have to say, the response that I got through social media was just so heartwarming. That convinced me more than my own research and writing, the way that people responded to it and, and felt like it was completely seamless, but also said, I've always wanted to believe in those sorts of things, but I ha didn't have the right science that could convince me. Yeah. Um, and I had piece, people in my personal life, people who work in the fashion industry, you know, completely unrelated things, saying, I've always thought of doing a vision board, but I've never done it before, but I'm going to do it now because of the science. And that was really, you know, kind of... Here's your permission slip. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned confusion a couple of times around your professional and personal life. Mm -hmm. How would you describe that medically through the neuroscience lens and how would you describe it through the spiritual lens if there is a difference because let's be honest we're all going to come up against confusion yeah. and i think especially since the pandemic to go back a little bit definitely personally speaking mm -hmm. coming up against those confusing moments of wait do i believe this wait is this right is this wrong like mm -hmm. I feel a challenge mm -hmm. to my way of being. I feel a challenge to my belief system. I feel a challenge to what I have been told is true. But for some reason, I'm just not accepting it anymore. I'm questioning it. Mm -hmm. What is going on from that neuroscience lens of, of confusion in our reality? And what is going on through the spiritual lens of that? I've never been asked that question before. It's a brilliant question. I love I'll it. I'll take it. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so... The first thing I was thinking about, you know, my own journey and the first part of your question is that there's some research from Canada about the opposable mind. Hmm. And that talks about the fact that one of the highest functions of the brain is your ability to hold two seemingly completely opposing thoughts. And, and that's just the first step, the fact that your brain can even hold two thoughts that seem to completely clash. If I can hold two thoughts these days, I'm killing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a win. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm just a guy who can't multitask for crap. So That's so funny. Um, and, and in the research, it says if you can sort of merge those two ideas to come up with a hybrid, a third idea that holds elements of the first two, but is superior oh, to wow. both of them. Wow. So it's, sorry to interrupt you here, but just to kind of help me understand and listen as we go along, mm -hmm. it's not both are true. It's that in some capacity, we feel allegiance or truth to both. And therefore, two things that are true that our opposites can't coexist. So therefore, we have to kind of like make a hybrid. Let me make it really tangible for you first. And then maybe we can go down Thank the you. more okay. intangible okay. route. Because um, I want to come back to the ghosts in your neural wiring that make you, be you know, believe neural certain things. Ghosts. Yeah, yeah. It's a oh, spooky season just ended, but I'll, I'll still true. take it. I'll just take <laughs> it. All <true>. right. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so I wanted to say that to you so we Thank don't forget to get back there. But when I um, teach this research at MIT Sloan, um, which is obviously the business mm -hmm. school part of MIT, I get um, the groups at each table to do an exercise, which is that you identify um, an area of business and two very different business models. Okay. So it could be something like a private jet company and like the lowest cost um, commercial airline, mm. or it could be, um, you know, a big, high volume, very low cost um, store mm -hmm. compared to a really high end kind of niche, unique, expensive okay. kind of store. So in the end, they're both offering the same technical product or service, yeah. but just they go about it drastically different. Yeah, yeah. And, the, you know, often people use examples of cars. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I ask them to actually write down the names of a business that's an example of each. So you might get a Walmart and a Barney's or something. Makes like it real. Yeah. Okay. And then write down the elements that those businesses stand for. And you do it for the what's good about it for the business itself, for the employees of that business and the customers of that business. So you write down as many, you know, you brainstorm as many points as you can. And then the actual task is to come up with a new business that's their own invention and the most fun part is naming going. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then t plucking the elements from each of the two different models that you want to bring into yours. So, you know, an example that I hear quite a lot is a low cost airline, but that has options for you to pay for certain perks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can pay for the aisle seat or extra leg room or food or drinks or extra luggage or whatever. 
Um, and so that that shows you in a really tangible way that you take two very different examples of a product and you can pick out the best elements of each and come up with a third, a hybrid type of product. And so in your mind, now we'll get back to the ghosts. In Spooky your season's here. Yeah. We're back, everybody. <laughs> All right. Um, the longer that you've held a belief in your brain, the stronger that neural pathway is. So you know that phrase, neurons that... Um, fire, fire, together, fire together, wire, wire together. Wire together, yeah. We're so reinforcing the, <coughs> the myelin sheath. Exactly. It's, it's just getting a stronger conduction. And do you remember how I said to you, as long as I've been conscious, I've believed in things like reincarnation, because I was just always told that. So from the age of naught to seven is where these most hmm. deeply held beliefs get laid down. So we enter the world, boom, it's happening up until about the age seven. Okay. Yeah, you know, and from seven to 14, there's pretty firmly held beliefs too. But the strongest ones are the ones that you're no longer even that conscious of. They're just the way that you operate. They're just the way that you believe the world works. And, you know, if you take something like reincarnation, it's absolutely part of my culture. It's what my, how my parents taught me that the world works. I specifically was repeatedly told a very strong example, which was that I was the reincarnation of my paternal grandmother. Wow. wow. So, you know, that was very much part of my childhood. But then later as a scientist, of course, I have to question that belief because it can't be proven. Um, so that's an example. That's quite an extreme one. But there will be lesser examples of things like that that we've all been conditioned with mm -hmm. by our parents and schools and society. So... When you come to an age where either because of a crisis or a very strong positive motivator, like you're getting ready to become a dad or you're getting ready to become married or, you know, move countries or something like that, where you have to rethink, you know, how you look at life. Um, or if you get to the age of 42 and nothing like that's <laughs> happened yet. There it is again. All right, yeah. Right. Um, then you're going to start having, you know, these the questioning of beliefs because you're just more aware of your mortality. Mm. Um, so for example, you know, this can really happen when we get to the age where we start to lose our parents, because then we realize that we're the next generation that that's going to happen to. And then you think, okay, what do I, what will I be proud of when I'm on my deathbed? And that might really force you to question some of your beliefs and how you've led your life up until now. Um, so has that answered your question of how would I respond to that both through the science lens which is the opposable mind part and then more spiritually which is that you know and it's combined with science which is that we have these deeply you know held beliefs in our neural wiring and for the various reasons that I've mentioned there will come a time where we will feel the need to challenge them and you know it could might not even be personal it might be the pandemic it might be the fact that most, you know, everyone in the world pretty much went through an unprecedented experience. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think, OK, maybe my life isn't just going to pan out how I always thought it would. There could be another pandemic that, you know, mm -hmm. um, if, if it happened once, can it happen again? I mean, now we have actuality. We have proof. We go from this what could be thing in our mind or doomsday story or, you know, preppers or whatever to, oh, no, actually, hold on. I went through it. You went through it. The whole world went through it. Yeah. So therefore, it's very real. Yeah. And the brain is looking for patterns, right? So it's looking for how is this going to happen again? Where is this going to happen again? How can you prepare for it? Yeah, and it's even harder to prepare, prepare for something that's not going to fit the pattern because the pandemic didn't fit a pattern of anything that we've known before. So, you know, in my mind as a neuroscientist, I'm like, what's the next thing that's going to happen? That is totally unexpected for us. Um, that's scarier mm. than another version of something that we've already experienced before. So as we go through these changes and we are now understanding how the brain works and how we can maybe explain some things tangibly, scientifically, and that other element, the spiritual side, what I believe we're kind of talking about here in a bare bones capacity is learning how to change our mind. Mm -hmm. Does changing our mind change our brain and vice versa? Can we do something with like thought and what we believe that actually is happening from a neuroscience perspective and the other way around, if we actually focus on improving brain health, does our mentality, does our mindset, does our thought process, does our mind actually change as well? Yeah, so there's, quite, there's actually quite a few questions mixed up in that question. I'll make and, it easy for you. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, one of the things to, to caveat my answer with is that this is actually often known as the hard problem of neuroscience, mm. which is about the interaction between thoughts and chemical processes. Like where does the mind begin and the brain end kind of yeah. thing? Yeah, and the duality of that, you know, whether it's both ways round or not. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of scientists would say that all of our thoughts and emotions and basically consciousness is emergent from neurons and chemical and electrical processes. Um, <clears throat> I guess the thing about, you know, what I'm seeing as scientists who are may maybe like 20 plus years older than me, being such examples of evolving spiritually themselves, mm is that I definitely, you know, in my 20s and 30s would have said you would be unscientific and, you know, I don't want to use like, <laughs> don't want to use a derogatory word, but I would have had a negative uh -huh. reaction to somebody that suggested that there was anything other than neurons and chemicals and electrical messages mm. that were creating thoughts mm. and emotions. I've already evolved along that pathway to think there's got to be something more than that. I'm here um, for it. I'm here for it, yeah. You know, and I've, I've, I've looked into research around near-death experiences, terminal lucidity, past life memories, something called mindsight, which is where blind people who've never actually had vision in their life, when they have a near-death experience, they actually see. Wow. Yeah. So I've looked at all the research around all of those things, and it's made me at least think... Mm -hmm that there is a way in which consciousness can exist without those physical aspects. But I don't know more than that. And I, you know, I can't prove it, but I'm very interested in it. Um, so, but the answer to what you've said is yes, because like I said, it was a multi-layered question. So the first thing to answer is that it, the way that you look after your body creates the environment that your brain and your mind exist in. And so absolutely changes that you make there make a difference to the functioning of your brain and your mind. Um, and I've had a, you know, a really recent example of this, which is not an experiment I would have put myself through by choice, but that I went through, which I'll, I'll come to in a second. So basically what I always say is the length and quality of your sleep and the regularity of it, that's key to the functioning of your brain. What you eat, how much you eat, how regularly you eat is key to the functioning of your brain. So those are pretty much my top two. But, you know, you also need to be hydrated. Ideally, you shouldn't be sedentary. You know, the more you oxygenate your brain by moving around or breathe, breathing deeply. Um, I know that you and some of your guests are big fans of really intense exercise. I'm not a fan of intense exercise, but, you know, exercise that is either oxygenating mm -hmm. your brain or like, you know, building um, muscle strength and tone they have different effects on your brain, but they're all good. But the high intensity stuff can be very stressful for the mm -hmm. brain body mm -hmm. system. So I don't love that. But um, and then basically stress management or mindfulness, um, you know, anything in the category of like keeping your brain body system not in the fright flight mode, but more in the kind of, you know, rest and digest and rejuvenate mode. All of those things are really important. Um, and I try to pay as much attention to those things all the time as I can. And I have been obviously for many years. And so during the pandemic, which I personally found very stressful for, you know, a myriad of reasons, um, I could see that all of that work I'd done on my resilience definitely really helped me. Amazing. So that's a positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, I regularly sleep for eight hours a night. I eat at least 30 different plant products a week. I drink loads of water, I am not sedentary, and I have like a very mindful way of living. So I've been very lucky. That's my area of research, and I brought that into my life like a sort of patchwork quilt over the years. I felt the same way <clears throat> as the pandemic came like very real. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn it, I've been training for this. <laughs> I've been training for this, you know, physical, mental resiliency, not to downplay the pandemic at all, but just, you know, I felt <clears throat> so prepared Yeah, as one, as much as one could be. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I feel that I had all the practices that prepared me as much as possible, but it was still such a challenge of to, course, the, the, you know, the mind and the body. And and I also want to say, but I think it's important for people like us to say this, to, you know, so that 
because it's relatable and if it's true, which is that since the end of the pandemic, you know, some people would argue it hasn't ended, but the end of lo lockdowns, mm -hmm. let's say, I have like lost some of the great habits that I built up during the lockdown. Really? Yeah, I spent so much more time in nature. I was growing my own vegetables. Mm. I was out for a, you know, walk in the middle of nowhere and you every kept day. These up. Not as much, you know. Mm. I've I've spent more time in London now, more time in LA, more time traveling again. Because you I, can. Because I can. Right, right. Um, and it definitely compromises some of those things. I mean, I'm lucky that my baseline for those things is pretty healthy, yeah. but I've definitely noticed that I've let some of those things slip. Um, and I have to make a more conscious effort to bring some of those things back into my life. So I'm, and I'm just saying that because I want, you know, if anybody else <clears throat> is feeling like that, I want them to feel like less guilty and think, okay, where can I start now? It's a because safe that, space. Yeah. yeah. Safe space. And, you know, the thing with neuroscience and neuroplasticity is always the best time to plant an oak tree was 200 years ago, but the second best time is now. So, yeah. and there are quite a few benefits to the brain of restarting good habits. So that's, that's my excuse. But anyway, um, so what happened to me like recently is I've been on this like mega trip to the States and you know, LA is my last stop. And the stop before was on the road in the Navajo nation. I saw this. Yeah. <laughs> I saw this. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I haven't shared too much about it yet, but I'm going to, a, but a, a video up on Instagram recently. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that week was late nights because we had to drive you know, for hours to get between all the places. Early starts because, you know, filming and the light and it was a group of people that we all had to get stuff done. I definitely did not have access to the kind of food that I usually eat. Um, and that was probably the biggest change for me. I could feel the difference in my body. I was making the healthiest choice that I could everywhere that I went, but my choices were, were limited. Um... I still did manage to sleep eight hours each night, but the timings were all over the place. Um, I tried to remain as hydrated as I could, but sometimes we were in the car for hours. So, you know, you had to be a bit mindful of that as well. Um, I definitely was very sedentary because we were driving for hours between sets and then filming, which was didn't involve much walking around. And But the one that, you know, was better than ever was I was in the most stunning nature. Um, in fresh air with beautiful vistas and such um, a great new experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. New experience. I mean, talk about a, I'd call that a spiritual imprint as well. Yeah. Yeah. So the spiritual element, the nature element, the, the meaningful relationships element was like a thousand percent, but all the more physical stuff was really compromised. And, you know, like I said, I would never choose mm. to, you know, to compromise my sleep times or my diet or my hydration or my, you know, not being sedentary, but it happened for like four or five days. And I could already, you know, tell the difference in my body since I've been back in LA, which is just under a week as of today, I've eaten 42 different plant products. Oh, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I knew I had to make up for that, that time because I could feel that it had, you know, already had traveled to the States a few weeks earlier and disrupted my gut microbiome with jet lag. And then, you know, eating out more than cooking at home. I got to get you on the fly kit game. Have you heard of fly kit? I'll, no. I'll, I'll tell you about this later. Okay. Jet lag now is a choice. It, oh, you I need no that. No jet lag. I need that. Zero. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. That's but literally, literally like yeah, yeah. the biggest issue that mm -hmm. I struggle with. Um, so, yeah. So just saying that basically practices that you may have had or incorporated into your life for a long time, they can really help you during tough times. Um, it's okay to have some ups and downs with some of those practices and, you know, find new things and bring them in or return to good habits. Um, but there's also research, um, and I think you've mentioned this to me before, that you're interested in it, the research on the U.S. Marines. Yes, you had this really unique example in your book uh, about um, this, uh, I call them platoon in the Army, I'm forgetting, I think it's platoon in the Marines as well, Yeah. Um, this group in preparation for deployment, went through this mindfulness training and, mm. and what happened? Um, so they had a control group that didn't do mindf mindfulness training and then an you know, age-matched group that, that were trained to do mindfulness for about a month before mm. going into a, a battle zone. And funnily enough, it was all in the group that was supposed to be the mindfulness training group that because they went into dorms or, you know, whatever you call it, Barracks. together, yeah, yeah. Um, 
it turned out that a, a few of the people who were in that group hadn't really taken it seriously and hadn't practiced the mindfulness. Mm. But when they got to, it was Afghanistan, um, they could see that their colleagues who had practiced mindfulness were able to sleep at night, mm. that they weren't sweating as much as them, you know, with anxiety, um, and that they, they could eat and they didn't feel like sick to the stomach with the stress of it all. And so they contacted the researchers and said, look, I know I was in the mindfulness group, but I actually didn't do it. <laughs> but I can see the difference wow. in my colleagues that did. So I want to start now. And the researchers said, of course, we'll like, you know, get you back into the training thing. But we're not sure if it's going to help you because the whole point was that you pre-prepared. Prepare yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what they found to their surprise was that almost as soon as you started mindfulness training, it reduced anxiety, it reduced insomnia. Even it, in the thing that they were ideally preparing for yeah. to alleviate, yeah. they saw significant change. Yeah. Wow. And like almost immediate. Wow. Um, in season two of my podcast, which I was telling yeah, you about, yeah. has some ancient wisdom stuff in it. I interviewed a dietitian, and we were speaking more specifically about your genetic or cultural heritage, mm. how important it is for your gut microbiome to eat with that in mind. Mm. So... Do you know your cultural, your genetic heritage? Mostly just English. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, my cultural heritage comes from a country where coconut trees naturally grow. Mm. So things like coconut oil, MCT oil, coconut milk, they are not only well tolerated, but good for my gut microbiome. Probably literally in your genetic makeup. Yeah. Those literally. fatty chains and proteins are probably yeah. how your proteins were wound down and like made you. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. But for you, if you had too many coconut products, that could actually disrupt your gut microbiome. It can actually have like the opposite effect to what it's supposed to. So Even though it's air quote here, healthy. Yeah. These are healthy things, objectively have great nutritional value. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I think eating with brain health in mind or health in mind or muscle, you know, building in mind is one thing, but understanding that that's really different for different people. Um, so obviously I was born and brought up in, in the UK, but for my childhood, I mostly ate Indian food at home anyway. Um, and I do love Indian food and I do cook it, but the, you know, the dietitian who's my friend said, Tara, it's really important for you that you're eating enough spices and lentils and things like, you know, and the more unusual mm -hmm. vegetables mm -hmm. that um, you can't always get in the supermarket. So, um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Well, you were bringing up ancient wisdom. Oh, yeah, I was bringing ancient, up, yeah. ancient wellness, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, no, sorry, I know where I was going with that. It was that, you know how I said that if you started practicing mindfulness, it had an almost immediate right, right, effect, right, right, right. even if you were in a stress zone. Um, if you change your diet, it changes your gut bacteria, the composition, the quality, mm -hmm. the quantity, also within a matter of a day or, or a few days. That quickly. Yes. So things like changing your diet, bringing in mindfulness they can have much more immediate effects wow. than we ever believed before. Even, you know, let's say definitely before the pandemic, if you asked me those two same questions, I would say, no, you really have to have a mindfulness practice and you'd have to like change your diet for a significant amount of time. You need like a reset, to, a yeah. gut reset, yeah, yeah, cleanse, yeah. 30 day, you, like healthy habit reinstallment. I was, I'd probably say like 12 weeks Wow, wow. to okay. change like the gut wow. microbiome. But now you believe something differently. Do you believe it or... Yeah. You yeah. prove it. Yeah, I, no, I believe it. The, con the consultant dietitian I spoke okay, to is okay. like a very rigorous academic dietitian. And, you know, Amishi Jha mm. is the professor that did the US Amazing. Marine yeah, study. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I definitely believe in her. Amazing. So you bring up this concept of, of ancient wisdom, ancient wellness, when we're looking at uh, best practices for a modern way of living. And you will say, you know, a healthy brain living. What else have you found from ancient practices that still hold true that you recommend for, we'll just say blanket statement, the average person here, mm -hmm. um, to really consider and to possibly adopt when looking at having a more curious and spiritually fulfilling life, but also mm -hmm. is actually going to do something for us here and now, physically, for the brain even? Yeah, so the way I want to answer that question is that I was taken aback by how obvious the answers to that question were, and that literally all of the things that we need to be the most whole as a human have been in front of our eyes forever. And we've just Preach. forgotten yes. or not seen. Yeah. Please, please, can you just reiterate that point for us? 
Um, the way I put it really succinctly is that everything that we need to be, you know, the healthiest physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually has been hiding in plain sight for millennia. So let's start with the, the most the most basic and the most fundamental one is nature. So you and I might have different taste in art or music or books, but nature is the palette that all humans have existed in since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And so we all find it pleasing. And that's not just mentally, it's physically. The effect it has on your blood pressure, your heart rate, your breathing rate, your stress hormone levels, whether your autonomic nervous system is in parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, or sympathetic, which is flight fright. And this, um, this is just, you're saying, being in being it. Being in nature. We don't, we don't need to be rock climbing, you know, free soloing, this kind of crazy stuff. We just need to be in it. Just being in nature. Mm. To be honest, Chase, just having plants in your house rather than not having plants in your house. It can be that simple. That really. simple, yeah. Have, you know, preferably having a garden, but if you don't, then you can try to get more plants into your house. Very much preferably going to the beach or the ocean or a forest or like the mountains. Physically you know, touching, If you can, with yeah, it. yeah. Getting into grounding a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, making it really basic if you can't, which is just having like a plant in your house instead of not having one. Um, and so I've talked about kind of the things I mentioned so far are the effect that it would have on you just being in, going out into nature like today. But if you regularly spend time in nature, then it actually has a positive effect on your mental health. So less anxiety, stress, depression, insomnia. It has a positive effect on your physical health. Did you know that trees and plants excrete a compound called phytoncides, mm. which actually trigger the release of natural killer cells in our immune system? Oh, hold, what? I haven't heard this. Damn, yeah. I thought I knew everything. <laughs> well, you kidding. know, if you hear That's, about forest bathing. Right, yeah, the Japanese art, I forget yeah. what it's called um, in Japanese, but forest yeah. bathing, basically. Yeah, so forest bathing, or even if you kind of, you know, hear about sound healing or nature mm -hmm. sounds. Mm -hmm. We have for so long now been saying, yeah, Right, that's not scientific. Right. That's woo-woo. Which, okay. to your point, the woo-woo, these are practices that the Japanese and like how many thousands of cultures across thousands of years have been doing, mm -hmm. maybe tapping into the spiritual side of, you know, taking care of themselves. And just thanks to science, now we have a scientific explanation. Both are true. Both are true. More of it's getting proven by science. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's one thing to say, to understand that breathing in fresh air and being in a place that's got natural sounds instead of unnatural sounds is better for your health. Like, I get that. And I'm happy with that. I'm happy enough with that to make the effort to go and do it. But when you hear that trees are excre excreting phytoncides that are boosting our immune system oh. through actual chemical processes, then you can't really not go into nature you have to okay now I'm, you have to get more plants in your house yeah now i'm thinking okay have we narrowed it down to certain types of trees and plants excrete more of this now i'm like i can imagine the, the hacker in me is like okay which park do i need to go to to get the majority yeah. of this to you know add another level to my wellness some are better than others and i did google it and i think really it's been it narrowed down yeah wow. yeah yeah so um i just remember off the top of my head that it was like cedars and cypresses and I think lime, hmm. um, but I can't remember all of them. So maybe you could put it in the show. That makes, I, I'll definitely have to do some research. And that, I mean, just thinking of a cedar tree and a cypress tree, how resilient are those trees? Those are some of the most old, the most old, longest living. They've endured crazy conditions. Yeah. Think of the lone cypress tree up in Carmel. Have you, are you familiar with this? No. So there's, I, uh, my first duty station was in Monterey. So I spent a lot of time in Carmel up in Northern mm -hmm. California. And you take uh, the PCH down to this one part in Carmel Valley, mm -hmm. and the, out on a point on a cliff, I'll have to put a clip up here, there's this iconic, just single cypress tree. Mm -hmm. out there. It's called the Lone Cypress. Oh. And over hundreds of years, just the erosion and just the roads and man and animals, just what it has endured to survive, and it keeps growing. It keeps protruding out. I mean, that doesn't surprise me. When we look at things that have withstood eons, Mm. there has to be an explicable or even unexplicable component to them that we're now reaping the benefits with. Yeah, That's incredible. 
when you when this podcast episode comes out, Chase, you are going to be personally responsible for the <laughs> massive <laughs> flux of people that are going to go and hug that tree and breathe it in. Oh uh, wow, we're, we're going to have to get a partnership with Pokemon Go again to get everybody yeah. outside. But uh, wow, this I'm I definitely am diving in more. This is incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know how I said we might have different taste in art or music, but right, nature yeah. is the palette that you know is is good for all of us. It's also so there's a book called Your Brain on Art by two incredible mm. women, Ivy Ross, who's the head of product design at Google. She used to be at Mattel. And Su- Susan Magsamon, who's at Johns Hopkins mm. in the Center for Neuroesthetics. We almost had them on the show. Uh, Did you? Uh, I think like last year. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah you should have incredible, them. Incredible. Yeah, they're incredible really stuff, great. Yeah. They're really great. Yeah. So they're episode one of season two of Amazing. my podcast. Um, and they were talking about the research on how indulging in creative activity for like 20 to 40 minutes most days of the week um, the benefits that that has on your health and mental health and longevity as well. So not necessarily, I don't need to be an artist, but just, you know, participating in some kind of creative outlet. So there's two elements to the way that they put it, which is making and beholding. Ah, oh, interesting. So okay. there's, there's a slight difference between you actually singing or playing an instrument or drawing or painting and you going to the theater or the opera or the ballet or reading. An this novel. is fascinating. Yeah. So both, both are good. Um, and it's very, very key that you do not have to be good at this. You know, if you want to sing out of tune in the shower or dance around really badly in your living room or color in a mandala because you don't mm. think you're good at drawing, that's all good. It's just, you know, doing the activity or experiencing the activity. How relieving for so many people listening right now. I know. I can still reap the benefit. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Tara said so. <laughs> exactly. And I thought, you know, I do feel a great responsibility to say mm. things like that, that I sometimes like, fall off the schedule of my good habits or you know I don't want anyone I definitely don't want anyone else to hear me singing but I'll <laughs> sing it you know I'll sing in the shower or I'll do very bad karaoke with like really close friends only or people that don't know me and so having said you know sort of like sing dance do art let's take that back to evolution mm. so we know that our ancestors um and and we're even going back to before we had articulated speech so we know that our ancestors in the cave hummed, um, played music like drum beating mm-hmm. particularly, which is very rhythmic. It causes entrainment of the heart rate and the breathing rate. Um, painted cave paintings. And um, so basically danced, created music and paint and did art. And in those days, we didn't really have time for luxuries. We did everything for a reason. We're just trying to survive. Yeah, exactly. So we think that, you know, the cave paintings were to plan a hunt or to like, um, you know, represent a hunt after it had happened, but probably more for planning. Um, The the beating of the drums, the humming, the chanting, you know, not with speech, but with sound. That would have been for like health benefits Mm. and like for bringing the tribe together through that entrainment effect. Wow. Um, And the dancing would have probably been because they were there were periods of hunting and gathering that were really intense and then there would have been a lot of rest periods when there was abundance of like stored food so it was probably to make sure that there was enough movement when they were in times of abundance like hold on, like, hold on cave people we're getting sedentary <laughs> we need to increase our neat <laughs> but exactly. they didn't know it but that's what they're doing yeah yeah oh my yeah. gosh this is fantastic fantastic and equally when people say to me now why do we need to do mindfulness? We didn't like do mindfulness separately to like our work and like personal life before. It's because in the cave, we walked barefoot in nature. We looked at the stars in the sky at night. We sat around the campfire with our family. And now if we're not conscious of making sure that we bring that sort of activity into our life, it's very easy to be switched on on your devices like 24-7, um, you know, sort of skimp on sleep, skimp on quality time with friends and family, just, you know, work super hard and um, kind of, you know, not not have really healthy practices in your life. Right, right. This is fascinating. Um, I'm so fortunate to have such a unique expert and person um, on the show today. So, again, thank you. But this is where I get to lean into who you are and what you do. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's just personal awareness theory. And I've had quite a few neuroscientists on the show. Uh, Dr. Mishi Jha has been on the show. Oh, um, cool. Shout out Louisa Nicola and so many other great neuroscientists and neurophysiologists. 
And I feel like right now, maybe just with social media or in the podcast space, it's a very trending thing. And I, I see and hear a lot of things coming out about the brain and neuroscience. And, mm-hmm. you know, my wife calls Dr. Andrew Huberman, science daddy. Um, you know, science daddies <laughs> <laughs> drop in. <laughs> Probably TMI, but whatever. Um, you know, there's so much fascinating... <laughs> There's so much fascinating news uh, or reinterpretations of air quote here news Mm -hmm. when it comes to neuroscience. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, how do I want to say this? What is actually going on in the current world of neuroscience that you really think is most worth people looking into? What is just a regurgitation of things that are, you know, half truths, whole lies, or just shoddy science? Um, I'll get to answering that question specifically, but I just want to like tell you the thoughts that are coming through my mind hearing you pose that question. So immediately I thought, you know, we have a looming, maybe not even looming anymore, dementia crisis in the modern world. Dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, type four diabetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a mental health crisis. Um, And we already had an issue with taking care of our mentally ill prior to the pandemic. But the number of people who were pushed over the threshold of mental illness during and after the pandemic is massive. Um, So when you think about neurodegeneration and mental illness, that's the reason that people are more interested in neuroscience. But I I do have to say, I was very pleased recently when someone said to me, neuroscientists are the rock stars of today. (laughs) Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Um, because, you know, I, I did my PhD 30 years ago. Neuroscience was not a sexy topic 30 Mm. years ago. Um, so my words, not yours. Was it pretty emerging the world of neuroscience, at least in this um, capacity to really make it a, you know, a profession? It wasn't emerging like, you know, I'm going to say that as a lab scientist, it wasn't emerging. It was definitely like, you know, established, but pretty much all you could do with, a neuroscience PhD at that time was stay in research in the lab or go to a pharmaceutical company. Stay in academia or, yeah, yeah, okay, clinical. Yeah. Um, And you couldn't do a degree in neuroscience when I was at university. And now, you know, I get emails and DMs from these kids all the time saying, I'm going to do neuroscience at university. And I I sort of feel like... You're like, cool, what? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm like, really cool, but, you know, I wish I could. Right, yeah. Um, And, you know, now you can do a straight degree, you can do a master's, obviously, you know, you can do a PhD... So, and I, I think just coming back to your question, so, so that's the background for me, but coming back to your question, less so now, but even when I was writing the source, when I said to my editors, you know, I really want a section that busts this myth about left brain, right brain, they were like, what do you mean? Mm. And I said, well, it doesn't work like that. We've known that for years now. And they said, well, no, no. The reader's not going to think that at all. The reader will think left brain, right brain is uh, is how it works. Sure. I said, well, even more reason to inform people that that's not. Right. You know? um, and I think we have like moved on from from that one. But that was definitely a neuro myth that mm. was kind of, I was constantly having to explain that that's not the way that we see it anymore. Now, do you think that was just a myth and, you know, kind of bundling maybe some other things in here? Do you feel like a lot of what is being shared and talked about now is neuroscience? Is it a myth or is it just, you know, we haven't caught up to the science. We're, we legitimately believe this to be true, yeah. but now we know it's not. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is okay. that. So it's the myths become myths once the science disproves them, but they stay um, popular in, in circulation. Like, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so the other one is you only use 10% mm. of your brain. Um, right. That's and, not true anymore? Well, it was never true. It was true. never true. It's never true, but we also now know it's not true. And I remember when that movie Lucy came out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I watched it on a plane because I wanted to watch it straight away because obviously it was uh-huh. like, you know, I thought it was a fascinating topic for me, but I was just so annoyed with it the whole time because the premise <laughs> it was based on was Wait, not. that's got to be a new YouTube channel. Neuroscientist watches <laughs> Lucy or Limitless. Or, or just, Transcendence. Right, or, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I do watch all of those movies. But we got to get, um, get your reaction, your commentary. Yeah. That would be quite funny, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think some of those older myths, like, they were still around mm-hmm. for a long time. I definitely think it's better now. Um, they've all, you know, we the reason that we know things that we thought were true before aren't true anymore is because of the more sophisticated scanning technologies that have come out. Mm-hmm. Um, like functional MRIs? Yeah, and, okay. and diffusion tensor mm-hmm. imaging. Because 
for a, the longest time, the only way that we really knew how the brain worked was by looking at it when cadavers, things have gone wrong. Right, yeah. Or well, not even cadavers, but even in like neurosurgery. Or like or, we would only look at it if there was a perceived issue with yeah, it. Yeah, okay. like a stroke or a brain tumor or a brain abscess or an injury. Um, that was how we worked out which parts of the brain did mm. what and like, you know, how much of it could be recovered and things like that. Now we can look at functioning brains and see what happens when you make a decision or you mm. experience a certain emotion or you, you know, carry out a certain action. Um or experience, you know, a food or a, um, you know, an interaction with someone. So now it's much more based on um, what's happening when things go right. And it's also based on just being able to see um, blood flow around the brain and um, just, you know, which parts of the brain are experiencing more electrical activity and are you, things like are that. Are you familiar with this group called Wave Neuro? No. Um, another great neuroscientist we've had on the show, Dr. Eric Wan. Uh, mm -hmm. former Navy uh, brain, mm. brain surgeon, I believe, actually. Um, he, I believe, is still with this organization called Wave Neuro. They're down in San Diego, and uh, they do these incredible live, basically, um, you know, brain scans that scan oh. front to back of the house of okay. every brain wave. I've done it twice now. And it's, oh. it's, a, it's this kind of new thing that I think is so cool where we're at with neuroscience and access to care and lowering uh, costs of things like this where, to your point, we normally would only get this when something is wrong. Mm -hmm. But now we can actually look at, okay, I got the gym membership where I'm working out, I'm watching what I'm eating. You know, what's another area that I haven't been focusing on mm -hmm. up to this point? You know, and for me, and I think a lot of people, that's your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go hop on a scale. We can get, you know, a DEXA scan. Mm -hmm. Up until now, we haven't had a way, again, unless something was wrong, to go, how is this up here? What's going on? And then using the information, like I have, okay, dial in sleep more hydration, more electrolytes, certain mm -hmm. key supplementations, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. We have yeah, so much great access to it. There is, and you know, but obviously not everyone's going to have access to that. But all of the things that you've um, just mentioned that you can do, these are things that people should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, focusing on your sleep, mm -hmm. your diet, your hydration, your movement. And, and just like slightly connected to that, but not exactly connected, is that... Um, I spoke at the Financial Times Weekend Festival in D.C. in the spring. And they had two panels that I really wanted to go to as well. I was on the longevity panel, but there was an AI panel and a psychedelics panel. Oh, yeah. All that's my world. Exactly, exactly. So I looked through the whole, you know, the, the timetable for the whole, Amazing. you know, conference. And I was like, those are the two that I want to go to. So I was very lucky I didn't have a time clash with those. Mm. And I got to go to them. And on the psychedelics one, there were three people on the panel but the, you know, the person I was just geeking out over was the kind of, you know, professor from Johns Hopkins with the big bushy beard and the mad scientist kind of look, but really like genuine, kind, lovely guy. And he, uh, you know, so I was more focused on what he had to say about the psychedelic um, based therapy than the other two people who are running more like private clinics for, you know, people who are well. And he said the research was really impressive and the results that they had seen after just one or two doses, you know, on things like depression and addiction was great. But he said, but none of it is doing anything that you can't do by sleeping well, eating well, practicing wow. mindfulness, exercising, and drinking enough water. And I just thought, that is so perfect for me to hear. You know, I think, yes, you can go and get a brain scan. And yes, you can, you know, take psychedelics as long as it's rig rigorously controlled by a therapist. Um, but actually, you can just go back to doing those basic things that we all know about. And that's probably how you're going to end up having the best life that you can have. So, again, this is just a reiteration. Um, you met, as he passed out here earlier, Tony Horton. If you're unfamiliar, this fitness legend created P90X and he's been in the fitness industry for decades. Literally, mm. He started the year I was born. Oh. And... I was like, Tony, what's the secret, man? You, you know, you've, you've seen so much, you've done so much, you know, so many iterations of fitness and people and all this stuff. And he, and he said the same thing. You did. Did he? He's like, move your body, have good relationships, which we haven't gotten to, eat well, go to sleep, water. And it's the best through line, no matter who I talk to on the show, mm -hmm. no matter the hack. Mm -hmm. Sure, certain things might move the needle in a unique way, but ultimately mm -hmm. we're all going to get there in a different timeline. Mm -hmm by doing these most fundamental things, and to your point, these ancient tactics. Mm. And I just want to say, you will hear this when you listen back. So maybe I've only dropped it in like in small ways, 
But I have talked about positive, social, mm. meaningful mm. relationships. Mm. So, you know, I mentioned that when I was on the road, that that was one of the things that sustained me, even right. though I wasn't eating yeah. well. Um, and I think I mentioned it another time as well. You're here when you, 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 like, you This has not been a journey uh, alone. You know, you've been talking about all the things that you do and how you mm. got there, and there have been other people along that mm. journey. And mm. it's definitely something I, I wanted to get to. I think we might have to cut a little short, um, but the power of relationships. Yeah. I'm sure you're aware of the Harvard study, um, this book that came out earlier this year called The Good Life. Uh, I had, I forget his name, one of the doctors on that is running the study now. Mm-hmm. It's an 82 or 84 year long study through Harvard mm-hmm. looking at all cause mortality, how people live their life, what gets them to you know that 80, 90 plus year old here in mm-hmm. America. The number one thing mm-hmm. that has kept people well and alive that long and happy happy is the quality of their relationships yeah so i haven't looked into that study particularly but i will but there is lots of other science that already just, backs just google up. the harvard study yeah yeah, yeah. And the book called the good life okay i definitely will because i i love that i think um you know personally my friends my family what i call my tribe is super important to me um and we know from evolution that we were not meant to survive alone you know, we could we would have perished like just from not just from physical cold, but, you know, the, the warmth we got, the warmth, the love that we got from our tribe, as well as huddling together for physical warmth was part of, you know, what we get to survive. And definitely all the longevity research now shows that having positive, meaningful social relationships is a factor in not just living for longer, but living well, like you said. Before I get to my final question, I just okay. want to, again, say thank you for your time and your expertise. I could sit here for hours. We'll have to get round two next time you're back that in the States. That has gone so quickly. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's flown by. Um, before I get to my last question, yeah. again, I got to take advantage of having someone like yourself here. If, no, if the listener walks away with nothing else from this conversation, from a neuroscience brain health protective angle here, mm-hmm. what is one piece of advice that you would advise, hope for someone to begin strongly considering and potentially entering into their habits every day? So I think for all of the reasons that we've discussed already, and we've covered a lot of ground, um, which I'm really pleased about, we've covered it broadly, Mm -hmm. so there's like something for everyone, is that your brain is a tiny proportion of your body weight. You know, it's kind of, it's just in there. It's that, you know, that kind of size. Um, But it's the most energy hungry organ in your body. If you live a life that is what I call brain first. So if you think, you know, what time should I go to bed because it's good for my brain? What should I eat because it's good for my brain? How much water should I drink? How much should I be moving around? How important is it that I prioritize spending time with my loved ones? And all the other things that we've talked about, Mm -hmm. nature, creativity, everything. Um, If you live your life in that way, then the knock-on effect on everything else you're digestion your heart your skin your hair your nails um your happiness Mm. um your feelings of abundance they're all going to get taken care of so you know that's how I kind of make my decisions if I'm thinking should I do this or that then I think okay which one's going to be best for my brain um and you know I've always been like very clear to say like you know I was going to say like as you know a woman but it's it's actually as a person you know I do care about what my hair and my nails and my skin look like but I know that if I'm taking care of my brain that's gonna Mm. you know be the best that it can be so if I take care of this it takes care of this Mm. kind of thing Mm. um that might roll into your answer for this but I I gotta ask anyway to live a life ever forward what does that mean to you how do those two words land on you well, we haven't really used the word neuroplasticity. Though. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How do we have a neuroscience podcast without neuroplasticity? Um, uh. So, but you know, it's related to everything that we've said. So neuroplasticity, we did mention it at the beginning, did, the ability did. of the brain to change throughout life. Um, so that means that, you know, you can change your thought processes, mm-hmm. even some of your like underlying beliefs. You can definitely change the way you act in the world. Um, and, you know, if you can influence your beliefs your thoughts and your actions and that has the effect on your work your relationships your health your fitness your love and everything um so it's a very obvious answer for me you know i ever forward is continually evolving um my personality type is very much chameleon and that completely goes with the fact that neuroplasticity is my area of research i'm 
always trying to learn a new sport or a new language. Humor's got to be good for the brain, right? Humor's very good for the All brain. All right, I'll yeah. take it. She's yeah, an expert. Yeah. She said it. I'll run with it. <laughs> I think that's a great way place to end. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tara, it's been amazing to have you on here. Thank you so much. Where can my listeners go to learn more about you, your book, your podcast? Where are you hanging out most online? Um, I mostly hang out on Instagram where I'm Dr. Tara Swart, D-R-T-A-R-A-S-W-A-R-T. Um, my book, The Source, is available on Amazon and my podcast is called Reinvent Yourself with Dr. Tara. I recommend it all. So much information. And again, I just want to acknowledge and respect and have so much gratitude for your approach to the scientific way of living, which, okay, this is how we live literally, but the unexplicable stuff and how to bridge that gap and how to help us kind of find our own bridge, build our own bridge. Because I think especially when we're looking at spiritual, the more personal we can make it and more innate it can feel, mm -hmm. the better the everything, right? Well, you ask the best questions to draw that out of me. Thank so. you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>